recording. Hi, this is Trent. Back for some more maps. I don't know. I'm not sure if I'm going to keep doing this every week. It's feeling a little, uh, much. Or rather, I feel like I'm not saying anything interesting. You know, I'm just kind of like floundering through two hours of talking at a computer. So, in the interest of quality over quantity. I don't know, maybe every second week I will keep everyone informed in the usual ways. But, uh, yeah, welcome. So, today... Today, the... The plan is to basically try and come up with some some new ideas, some design ideas. Um, and I just kind of want to walk through my... I mean, it's part of the creative process. It's like basically, it's the first part of a creative process. And um, basically walk through some ideas about how to get into a creative mindset, um, but also just some more practical things about uh, about like how to, I don't know, structure a thought process towards a very specific goal when it's completely open-ended, um, because that's like, I think the hardest part, at least with making music, you know, you can be like, oh. I will make something that makes sound and use that as a jumping off point. Um, but sometimes with like instruments or sound devices, objects, whatever, uh, it's really hard to get started. So I don't know. We're going to try out a few things. Um, so I don't have, I thought I, I have like a book that has all of these designs in it. They're all like, uh, some are literally three words. And others are, you know, half a page of writing or some drawings. And others are like, you know, dozens of pages articulating all the finer details of the thing. Uh, the point is, I have a lot of them because I think you have to go through a lot of ideas before you can get to anything. Well, you're more likely to find a good idea if you try out a lot of different ones. So, um, yeah, uh, in the interest of, like, not in the interest to get started, I guess. I, I want to do like a 15 minute, um, 15 minute warm up design. So we're going to try and take some abstract three word idea and turn it into at least a little bit more of a concrete thing, something that can be kind of addressed and, and designed more with more detail um so yeah i have a little book here with some some drawings and writings that i don't know that any of them are particularly suitable to this but i'm just going to try and find something quickly um which is even just like finding some words that's all writing about it's generally writing about synthesizers so easy to find something and be like, oh, let's let's try and make this thing real. So. Thank you. 
Okay, everything from then on is actual real things that I want to work on but don't want to talk about. So, one thing I've been really interested in is looking at um, the, or like seeing discussion around the Korg Volker series and also the Teenage Engineering Pocket Operators. Um, so let's do something like that for 15 minutes. Let's work on a design. I'm just going to set a timer. Which will be a loose panel, but you know, it'll you know, give us the instruction. Okay, so I don't know, I'm just gonna start. I'm just gonna start writing some things. We'll see if the. Let me know if they're not legible, because I can change the camera angle, etc. Oh, okay, so. How can we like write this thing? A portable um, key. I mean, instrument. Let's see if we can refine that. Um, so, you know, with all of these things, they kind of take these like gen generic. Uh, you cannot read that, that's for sure. Um, Portable cheap instrument, that's what it says. Let me see if we can get rid of that glare somehow. If I have it high. Okay, I'll get a box. Hey, there we go. Oh, FYI. This is... Owner operator Rombi cube oc Rombi cube octohedron. You can get it on SoundCloud if you like the sound. Okay, so we got these three things. They always do them in these very classic ways of like uh, monosynth, base, base synth, basically polysynth, drum machine sampler, FM synthesizer, and, you know, the pocket operator, that's all the Volkers, basically, they have, like, a modular, which is a thing, um, but then there's also, like, uh, the pocket operators kind of do the same thing, so, in the interest of doing something some slightly different, why don't we, what do we do, like, a uh, before we even worry about what it does, right? We want it to be portable and cheap. Let's make so we'll make it battery powered, and we want it to be like handheld, right? I feel like that the pocket operator is a really fun because it's like a graphics calculator from from high school, and I don't know. That's like a fun form factor. But what about like I don't know. Like I always love a game controller, you know. So and like the classic. Like the, the NES controller is great, like, just a rectangle. I love it, you right? I don't even know what the world looks like. Something like that. 
it's pretty boring. You could make maybe around the edges or something, make it more like a Super Nintendo. Um, and I guess it could be a little larger, but like that kind of idea. Oh, you need more. You need more sound. How about I move the speaker closer? I wish there was a ledge right here. Turn up like a party. Well, I turned up the music anyway. Um, I can turn it up. So, and the controller, right? It's like to connect the system. Um, but like one of the cool things in the Game Boy and the original Game Boy, yes, and stuff, is you could connect two of them, right? With like this this cable. Where you can play like um, multiplayer. So, this is something like a, a networkable handheld instrument. Um, which, you know, you can plug it into a computer and stream it over the internet. So, in, in these coronavirus times, you could still play. Well, why is it being choppy? Stop that. We'll see if it gets better. Okay, so. I think that makes it, that's like kind of fun, right? Network. And it doesn't make it more expensive, thankfully. So that's cool. If we want to network things, then we can have like different functionality. So, So these things are like, okay, so in both of them, they're centered around a sequencer, right? So, and the question is like, okay, do we want to have a keyboard where we play things in live, or do we want to have an algorithmic thing where we like turn knobs or push buttons or whatever? Um, I don't know, but I want to draw this really, I'm going to draw a big Super Nintendo style controller. Yeah. One thing I love about game controllers is they have these, they have a bunch of this, right? It makes it so much more fun because you can like interact without getting in the way of the interface. So let's add bumpers. Um, you know, maybe they could be like shift buttons or maybe they're going to be kind of triggering events. Um, Oh, we have these, um, if anybody's ever played a PSP, they have like a little joystick, it's super flat though, um, so it doesn't make the interface really high, but I feel like that could be a really fun way to like, change sounds, also kind of like the chord key oscillator, those things are really fun. They made like great sounds and they were also cool because you didn't have to know anything about music to make something that sounded nice and you enjoy it. So maybe having some kind of XY thing would be a good way to do that. So yeah, let's just do it. Um, joystick. It's just like, it's like a flat plane. It doesn't have to to move, it's just a flat thing that slides it up. Um, buttons always feel really good, right? Um, like touchpads, fine, whatever, touchpads are touchpads, but um. Combination, maybe? One thing I've been wanting to do is build something that has 
a touch strip around a potentiometer or around something else. So uh, as kind of like you know, on a CDJ, you have this like you have the stunted thing you can spin, and then you have the edge where you can kind of track back and forth if you you know push and pull. Kind of a fun thing that you can try. Like, I don't think that's the best. Why don't we just do two buttons? Keep it classic, right? Something like this. So the, I don't do the end of the fingers. Um, and then it's like, what happens here? Do we have some kind of play? What if we had... Okay, so check this. What if it was a... Visual display interface. Um, and what if this was also a touch strip, right? So something like this. And then maybe we can have like a single, like, yeah, so this button is going to be like a menu or like. Me, all right, so you have a system and so you can save and load or connect or whatever you, whatever it is you want to do. Um, this doesn't seem like enough buttons to like have this whole thing happen, but it's like is it really because of the music though, or is it just the screen? Oh, I'm changing the, the volume on the wrong thing. Okay, well, we'll try. Um, I don't know, it kind of looks like a sneak pattern. All right, well, we have four minutes, so let's make it do something. So, All right, so I'm going to call this, I think this like touch strip here is going to be like the articulation uh, mechanism. So this is how you play a note and we can do it. Um, we can do this uh, like an omnichord. I don't know if you got anyone sort of play with one, but like it's this touch strip that you kind of like, you kind of you can strum it or you can tap it to get different tones out of like a edgio essentially. So maybe maybe that's it. If you want to do our edgios, why don't we make it? Let's just make it a synth, right? And. Okay. This is going to be articulation, but not in terms of plucking a note. We're going to do like notes on on here, or maybe it'll be over here. But that's that's an idea. So you press this to play a note. This thing kind of changes your your scale. Um, so this will be basically like an. Uh, this is essentially an arpeggio. Kind of, right. Well, like. Maybe scale is just the right word. Um, so we have this idea. That's cool. The joystick can like move. It's it, they can kind of work together, I think. But how is it going to actually make anything? When we plug stuff in. All right. This is the point where we erase it and try again. <laughs> I'm just going to draw it rectangularly because it'll make things easier. Okay, so we have one button here, one button here, piston, joystick, touch strip, two buttons. That's it. It's pretty like that too, I like it. 
Okay, so... Um... Okay, so the two sides are going to be different articulations. I think this could be a fun way to kind of get started. So this side uh, is like strike a note. And whereas this side is... It's almost like I want to be like a... Maybe it can be whole, actually. Yeah. Yeah, so like a, it's a sustain pedal essentially, but it's only your fingers. So we got this. We could do two, but it's going to make the mechanical stuff too complicated. So I'm going to just stick with two really simple. The idea for this device would be it would be, um, you know, under two hundred bucks, maybe maybe one hundred. So one circuit board with everything attached to it. That would be the goal. I think. So, um, this is bass down here, and treble, and <laughs> that's indicating it's a touch strip. Okay, and then these, oh, right. I'm going to give myself two extra minutes because we uh, had the speaker moving and everything. Oh, I have moved the computer. Okay, so face and trouble. Um, so what else do we need? We need tempo. Oh wait, we're not doing. It doesn't even have to be a sequencer. Okay. And. Let's make it digital. <laughs> Sounds good. So it'll make thing it make it just makes certain things possible. So this touch strip is basically controlling the the central note. Um, that's the central pitch. Um, we'll make it quantized, which. Maybe the quantization or scales are set here with these two buttons. Um, and then the, the joystick, I think we could do a cool thing where in this dimension, the vertical dimension, it sets the width of the chord. So the idea being that when you press this button, um, it'll play it'll play a chord normally. If you pull it all the way down, it'll play all the tones in unison. If you push it up, um, it'll spread out the notes, right? I think that's that could be a fun way, fun thing to do. Um, whereas if you go into the X Y dimension, the horizontal dimension, um, I see a comment about filters. Um, but, hey, should we do a filter? I feel like more, even more than filter, I want to do like a, like a wave shaper, essentially. Like, it could be sine waves with wave shaping or even FM between the voices. Um, yeah, so let's say wave shaping. Okay. So I'm going to say these two um, set scale and like root note, and you would you would hold one and like use the touch strip, or hold one and, and toggle back and forth, and the these LEDs would show you what your choice was. We could write on here, you know, like in the on the top of the panel. The tone, right, etc. We could do twelve. Um, that would be a nice, simple thing. Could be like this. Could be listed in like a cycle of fourths or whatever. 
Um, so using the root node, you'd be able to change chord. But maybe that's actually really, that's really awkward. What if it was, these could just be cycling. It could just be going up or down. Um, or maybe, oh, even better. So it shall have internally a memory for all these different settings. And so you'll be able to have a sequence of eight things, which perhaps we can illustrate separately up here. Um, and these are basically a sequence step. Well, it's, it's, it's more of a memory step, actually. So it's like a manual sequence. And this contains, uh, how do we we'll do it as a list? Uh, it contains a scale, a root note, um, and perhaps that's it. I think that is nice because then it keeps, uh, oh, sorry, and then the idea would be hold this one to select memory stage, and then then use the bumpers to kind of, so you'll hold this button and then cycle back like left or right with the top two uh, bumpers. I think that's kind of a cool, that's an idea, right? It's not meant to be a finished idea, but um, I feel like that could, that's something that is like, I don't know, a fun thing to, to think about and look at. I'm going to take a photo, and then we're going to move on. I'm moving the speaker again so I can turn it up. All right, that's it. Okay, uh, I don't know how successful that was, but it was something. Um, just friends in a video game controller. I've certainly thought about it. I love reading these comments sometimes. I'm just being like, oh, these ideas are better than what I was thinking of. <laughs> a switch under the joystick. I like the idea, but also I always find that that's really difficult because you always move the joystick when you're trying to push it down. But that's probably just because those those joysticks are always like too stiff to push down that button. Maybe I just have played the wrong systems. But that would be cool. I wonder if it would make it too thick. Yeah, okay, so the idea, one cool thing about most design things like this, I find, is that uh, I was imagining it as being a piece of hardware where inside is the synthesizer, you know, inside is the thing that makes sound, is that generates things, but like there's nothing stopping you from, you know, attaching like an Xbox, Can, are they all just USB now? You can just attach it to a computer, and it could be a soft set, even, you know? Um, so a lot of these ideas are kind of like, they're not linked to hardware. I just usually think in the hardware mindset, because, I don't know, to me, that's how I've always related to musical instruments. Okay, so... Um, I don't know, that's fun. Sometimes it's like really hard to forge through that first section and be like, okay, here is a, like, I'm just gonna come up with an idea. It's not, it's not super easy, I don't know. 
Uh, so another thing that I like doing about these like 15 minute things is, um, or even like what we're gonna, what we're gonna do next is this idea that any idea you have, you're gonna be really excited about it when you have the idea. Like that's just like the rule of every idea. Like in the moment you think of it, you're like, yes, this is the thing. Um, but often you like, well, if you keep working on it, you'll just run out of steam and like it won't go anywhere. And then it'll always be like one of those things that you tried and it was too hard, so you're not gonna go back to it. Um, but what I find is really cool is having a good idea, spending a uh, like short window of time trying to flesh it out as much as you possibly can, and then being really strict about putting it down and saying, I'm not going to touch this for a day or two weeks or however long. And like just articulate it enough so that the core of the idea is there. Because like you just have to make it good enough that you can come back to it and understand. And I think that doing that, you often like very quickly weed out the bad ideas from the good ones. So that's like one little thing if anybody's building stuff. I don't know. It's always it's helped me a lot. Um, okay, so let's make a thing. Do I do electronics and programming streams? Uh, programming, yes. Electronics I've tried, it's kind of difficult though, like getting the camera with the software, I've had a, I kind of haven't gotten super comfortable doing that, so it's mostly just programming and then sometimes weird things like these. Sometimes you get to watch me pour water on computers. Um, brainstorming is super fun. Okay, so if anybody has an idea, even a word or a category, um, category of ideas because I feel like I have so many different things but it's like I've got the serious ones I'm working on that I feel a little sheepish about doing online because I don't want people to judge ideas before they're fully formed uh, so that's kind of I'm not super worried about people stealing ideas I'm more just like I feel like if you if you tell people about something too early they can make uh, judgments about it that are hard to undo even though they're based in they're based on nothing, or more or less nothing. So, with that idea, we're going to try and make something that is like a new idea for me. So yeah, if anybody has thoughts, I'm going to take five minutes just to kind of think for a second. I don't even know. Three minutes, two minutes, one minute, however long. Okay, I have, a, I have a question. How many people here in the comments, um, how many people are kind of like, are into Eurorack versus how many are not? Because I have an idea that's Eurorack, but I don't want to bore everybody if that's not your bag. Ooh, for a specific person, that's a nice idea. Alright, we got a lot of, we got a lot of Eurorack fans.
specific person thing is really interesting. Um, and it brings up a very obvious, very important point, which is first question is, who is your audience? It's like you get to go back to second grade in school and say, who am I writing this for? And like you can say, Eurorack is an audience, but I would say that there is many subsets of that audience. Um, one, okay, so is this the other we can do? I'm gonna write a couple things down, and maybe we can choose. So the first one is kind of a weird idea. It's a bit inspired by the I don't even know what the what brand they're under, but one of Peter Blasser's concepts, which is paper circuits. Um, and taking that idea and mashing it together with the idea of Eurorack blank panels. Yeah? So the idea is loosely, you have a PCB, which is, a, it, it's got mounting holes to go in a Eurorack case. Um, and it's got a design, but the design, so it's all, it's, it's a PCB, so it's got traces everywhere. Um, and the idea is there's like some kind of circuit, right? So basically places where you can um, mount components. Something like this. Um, that can be connected together in some kind of way that makes uh, that makes it useful, and you would attach it in this style. Um, so let me go through this over here. So this is where, where do I go? This is the circuit board that I made to test out an idea. It didn't work, um, but you can see it's it's a circuit board. And it just has holes drilled in it. And that's where you attach all the jacks. So when it's put together, it looks like this. And then everything on the back is like hand wired onto the PCB, onto like these pads that I have there. So that's one concept. One idea. Let's, let's, uh, let's look at something else as well. Okay, so this is one thing you can do. Write this up here as like a circuit blank. It doesn't make sense, but another idea um, that I've been wanting to pursue for a long time is making a touch face interface. Oh, not even necessarily all touch, but a some kind of digital meaning I two C capable interface um, for your rack. So I'm thinking it would be relatively large. Um, and the goal would be it would be a some kind of keyboard slash sequencer. For I mean, just friends was the was the original impetus, but there's obviously other things that can take. Um, input, um, but also a kind of tape manipulation system. Um, that would be for width, um, but then also it would have TVIO, so it could be used as a general purpose interface. Um, so we could talk about this. 
Okay, and then there's two more things. I'm gonna do them together. So, get more different colors. We have everybody. Okay, this is like a little passe now, but everybody was at some point trying to make mixes for your app, right? Um, so we could do a mixer in the spirit of kind of going along with all the stuff I've designed in the past. Um, it would be a mixer about uh, relationships of signals. So like, usually everything is treated independently. Um, but the idea is with a mixer that I would design, it might have some kind of uh, interactive quality between the different circuits. In a number of ways, we could do that. And then the other thing I was looking at, this one's really weird, but I'm, I don't know, I think it might have something going on, is, um, you know, people always throw around this idea of an analog computer, but I think, okay, I've been doing, I've been doing some research and reading a lot of papers and old, old writing about the bucket rigging chips. Um, which are classically used for analog delay. Um, but more interestingly, I think, is... I mean, it's really just an extension of the idea of sample and hold. Um, and if you think about it, a computer program's execution is taking data and passing it through, essentially passing it through a number of uh, manipulations, transformations. Um, so the idea of using a bucket brigade style or a sample and hold style sequential processing analog computer. Does that make sense? So basically the interface would be the computer program. Um, and you would have, you know, maybe two or three inputs. And then you could have two or three outputs. And then basically, this interface would be the program. And so it could do any kind of analog calculation. You know, we can make a circuit that does addition, multiplication, division, logar logarithms, exponentials, and we could stack them up as a series. So, those are the four ideas I'm thinking about. And why don't the idea, sorry, the idea, one last thing. Because it's like this sample and hold thing, it's clocked, right? So you can control the speed, meaning the frequency, or the time of the calculation by varying a clock signal. So that would mean uh, if it was doing a filter calculation, you would do that. I don't know. Um, okay, these are the four options. You have you have ninety seconds or sixty seconds to decide by sheer force of will. That is that is the way you cast your vote.
I was gonna make a drink, but it's not quite five o'clock, so I'm gonna we can give it a rest. Amateur dance party. I like your I like your handle. More patch programmable. That's an interesting idea. I feel like everybody likes the computer because I talked about it the most. <laughs> okay, okay. Computer, computer, mixer, computer, mixer, mixer, mixer and computer, computer, something else. What, what is that tally? Is that equal between... Oh no! Does that tip it towards mixer? Yo, if we do mixer, we can make it patch programmable. Computer driven mixer, right. The problem with doing them both at the same time is it basically just becomes a whole instrument. You don't need like why would you put it in a in your rack if you could just uh, have that thing. That thing would do everything, right? I don't know, maybe it wouldn't. Okay, let's do some kind of mixer. Don't worry, I will I will think about the computer. <laughs> a mixer with analog logic. <laughs> Cold one, right. If anybody wants to take these ideas and run with them without me, that's also fine. Just send me an email. Let me know. I love to I'd love to know what you're working on. Okay, a mixer. Do I have any notes about this? Okay, um, let's just start writing. Okay, so, right, matrix. Let's talk about the different kinds of mixer and then figure out which direction we're going to go. So, we're going to say we have a mixer. And maybe before we, okay, before we do that, or rather, okay, there's too many different ways to do this. So we got a matrix is one option. We have classic, like, channel-based, um, where you have, like, individual control channels. This is kind of like you have individual X, Y. This is like you only have individual X control. Um, and in the channel base, we can have basically um, lots of channels, or we can have lots of sends. That's kind of a trade-off, right? Because if you have a given space, you're either going to go for sends or you're going to go for more channels. Um, mixer typically means just talking about volume, but also like a console, right? A mixer also does filtering. And there's also, in some cases, uh, compression or expansion. So we can do those. Um, so I think those are kind of like, that's the set of, the loose set of ideas to kind of really consider. Um, one big question for me is whether it is very manual, so meaning traditional. Um, so traditional is like individual knobs for everything. Or we could go for like a more automatic style. Um, which is kind of more like a, I'm trying to think of an example. In a way, it's kind of like multiband compression. It's not really, but it's like you have these different, you kind of set up influence, which drives like whether one thing is further forward than the other. So this is kind of more about defining relationships, right? Defining, um, Right? 
for um, presence is a, is a word that typically means mid-range, but I think it's an interesting idea. So it's a good word, even if it doesn't mean what this novel means. Um, okay, so this, this very important question. Who are we making it for? Right? Okay, uh, yes. Yeah. Volume and space. Meaning and, but also reverb and stuff. So, I think the big question about the audience is like, well, what that really is going to affect is how physically big the thing is. Um, which probably relates to how large of a Eurorack system we're expecting it to be put into. Um, so physical size, and then like text, which, which is really about how many voices. Um, I feel like these things really change who is interested in this device. Um, it's like, what else is there? I want to grab a, a panel to look at in terms of class. Okay, so we have These two things together, you can't even see that really, but um, these two panels together, this is 32 HP. Um, and I have a couple rules about how I do like knob spacing and stuff. So choosing the size of it kind of defines how many knobs we can have. Um, like I really dislike very strongly the the mini knobs that don't have a knob, like the the things that are just pot shafts, I really like. To me, that is not what I want an instrument to feel like, so I kind of refuse to put them in designs, um, even if that makes things less flexible than they could be in the given size. I think it's not a trade off that I want to take. That is an aside. Who is the audience? <laughs> okay, so personally. Um, I really, I really love small systems, and for me that means something between, like sure, you can make a small system that's like 48 HP or something like really tiny. Um, I think in a lot of those cases you're really kind of more thinking like, oh, I have these two modules I really like, I want to make a module, I'm a case out of it. A mixer is not going to be about that context, right? Um, unless it's like a no input thing, but there's so many people doing that stuff that I think it's not really something worth uh, spending time on, like having another person spend time on. Um, but a small system in the sense of like, I have a case down here that is empty, but it's got 2 times 84 HP. And then I think the isms case is nice. It's like 120 HP. It's too heavy. That's why. That's, that's basically the whole reason we don't didn't make more of them. It's too big and bulky, and specifically too heavy. Um, but like that kind of idea. So, question for you. This is like a a reasoning thing. How many voices are typically in a case of around 150 HP? So let's say Sorry. total size, and this is about audience, right? Total size 150 HP, um, number of voices, four, five, yeah, four or five. Um, I don't like, 
Typically, oh, we have this stuff. It's taking on a much greater significance of prophecy. Um, I do not want that. Uh, we'll find some more music. Um, typically, I like designing in threes or sixes. Two to four voices would want four inputs, though. Two, given sufficient modulation and a few larger modules. Two to three, four. Um... Right, okay, so. Oh, this is a great mix, let's play that. Oh, is this going to run out of battery? Okay, let's say... The problem with having six voices is you take away the ability for less voices to have uh, tight, like more control. That's the balance here. Okay, so let's say, let's do this. Let's say three full voices. Three, like, parametric voices. And maybe three uh, additional inputs. So those could, like, kind of plug into the mix. Um, yeah, feedback and stuff. That's... I mean, this is kind of what Matrix thinks about, is really just feedback. Um, but maybe if we have those additional inputs, we could use those as feedback returns. Um, I have a fucking header on the back, I'm good. Okay. I feel like this kind of makes sense. If you have, like, multiple oscillators making up a single voice, then maybe you can mix them before they hit this, or you can just mix them with a stack cable. Um, that would be nice. I think, in terms of the size, you know, smaller is always better. I really don't like the, the full square, but we can go a little wider than that. That's probably six. So, somewhere in the, like, 20... 26 HP from, let's say, 25 to 30 HP. Obviously, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do an odd number. Not because I think it's bad, but because everybody else does. Right. So this could be used in a larger system. Um, and you could have multiple of them, or you could use this as a submix for your oscillators or for your drum section, or you could use it at the very end and you would have submixes before it and kind of pass it like, here's the like the leading melody voice, here's the background pads and stuff, or here's the, the percussion. Um, so I think that sounds good. Let's keep let's do that. I'm just gonna jump through this like traditional like individual knobs for everything and say, we just don't have room for it, right? Um, because if we wanted to do anything more than just volume, then I think we're going to run out of space really fast. Um, okay, so let me, let's look at the module. I can't even hold that up. It's so this is a, a mangrove panel, right? I don't know if everyone knows it. This one's kind of a messed up prototype. But um, I'm, I'm holding it up to kind of show the spacing, right? If anybody has one, the spacing between these two knobs is too small. It makes it really awkward to get your fingers in there and, and turn things. So and this is the first module I designed. Um, and I kind of learned some lessons in that process. It's a lot to fit in 48 to 24-ish HP. That's, that is absolutely true. Um, so I think 
the adding channels thing we could do, but I, I don't want this to be a console, you know? Um, sorry, I always get distracted reading these comments. CV, that's a good point. Let's make a note of that. CV capable. Even if it's just from a like construction, like background point of view. The point is the spacing between the, the knobs that are far enough apart is 1.05 inches. Um, this is all to say, we're gonna draw an outline and figure out how many knobs we can have. Oh, oh my god, I can't draw a straight line. Okay. It's gonna be maybe even like that. Something a little bit wider than square. Which makes it, yeah, 26, 28, 30 HP. Upgrade it to 26 as the minimum. Um, because I think 25 would make it square, and we don't want that. Okay, so let's say this is 30. Um, that's 6 inches wide, right? Um, Right, envelope follows, we'll get to this. We ha I have an idea that's gonna like, I think make this re thing really interesting. So 30 HP, let's go, let's use that as a, as a concept, right? Let's just say 30. We need a number, which makes this six inches wide, which means with a smaller knob, the max you can fit across the panel is five, right? Um, and we could do two rows, but we're gonna run out of space for jacks. Um, but let's say we got three channels, right? So let's do one large knob, three large knobs, I don't know. The point is we'll put them in, it takes up a lot of the space already. We could fit probably five more like this, and then maybe we have some switches. And then we got a big jumble of jacks down the bottom. Um, which I think, maybe we don't want to just be a big block of jacks because that'll be like overwhelming to look at. Um, but something in that realm might get us started. I don't want to do a symmetrical thing, but that's just to kind of prove the point that we have realistically three big, five small, and say we can probably actually do six switches if we need them. Um, as a concept for sizing. Okay, so what, what do I want to do? Uh, I'm out of time. All right, we have almost an hour. Okay. Um, so the number one thing that I'm really interested in and I think could be cool is... Uh, okay, I'm going to get distracted again. Am I sure I want to take this on? I'm I'm not promising I'm going to build it. I'm just spending an hour and a half working on the idea. See if there's something worth pursuing. Okay, so I want to. I, I feel like this this idea of strength and presence is going to work really well. And I think what we can do to make that like how that's going to work is basically that there's a a submix or like a some kind of matrix um, some kind of mixed matrix thing which represents the relative strength and maybe presence of a channel and I think that's going to relate back to these two ideas right filter and compression um,
I'm just making some stuff smaller so I can whack out this board. Okay, we haven't figured out that answer yet, but I got the rest. Okay, so I want to quickly talk about this decision. So when people use matrix mixes, I think, usually, um, Usually it's for f doing feedback patches, right? Feedback, feedback, feedback. Um, because a matrix mixer is not typically the end of a chain. It's kind of like the middle of a bunch of other sources and things. And I guess the question is, do we want to make something that is kind of, you're going to stick at the end of a chain, um, or do we want to make something that is specifically designed for the middle, like part of the articulation of a voice. I think that what I'm interested in is, um, I, th I think I want to do something that's more like channel oriented. Um, So I want it to make sounds that you could send to the output, but make it also flexible enough that you could put it in the center. I think it would work. So I'm going to say it's not a matrix mixer, but it might be designed in a way that you could kind of User. The issue with, I think, in this context, the matrix mixer is uh, the matrix is too big, and how would you control it? Well, it actually, brings it, it brings us to a good question. How many outputs does this thing have? Um, and I think that relates to whether or not we're doing panning, and if we are, what kind of panning? Um, part of me likes the idea of having like a mid-side output. But, you know, maybe that's too, that's just like putting too many buzzwords into a project. Um, but I think that's an, that's an important question. <laughs> Output number. Let's come back to it. I have an idea for the general concepts that I want to talk about first. So let's have one big knob. And maybe this feels like overkill, but go with me here. This is going to be the overall volume, main volume. 
and it's going to be CVable. And this is off. And this is loud. How loud? Doesn't really matter right now. Um, this will be 84 HP in the end, exactly. Um, <laughs> I've been playing 84 HP, now I can console. Love that. I'll make one, and I'll co it'll cost $8,000. Actually, probably eighteen thousand dollars. Let's be honest. Um, okay, we have a main volume, and I think what I want to do is I want to have uh, okay. The big idea that I want to pursue is that there is a sound analysis engine in the background that is basically analyzing the input signals. This track is so good, I don't care if you can hear me or not. Let's draw a channel. So the idea, every input has a volume control, which is a VCA, um, and the so basically the input goes in, gets the volume gets changed. Maybe these are in the other order. It doesn't matter for now. Um, and then that volume goes into a filter, and that filter, it's not going to be like a. Uh, It's not going to be a low-pass filter. It could be a band-pass filter. But more probably, it's going to be a peak boot or a peak cut, a peak notch filter. Which you basically build around a band-pass filter. Um, ooh, and we could kind of do a variable. You can do a blend between those two things. Um, So, what I want to do, I want the input to come in, and I want to run some kind of calculation in the background, some kind of analysis, which basically gives me a continuous reading of the volume. Um, so we're going to uh, analyze volume, so that's like your envelope detector. Um, but also, I want to analyze spectrum. And what does that mean, I guess? Uh, to me, it means, it could mean a couple things. We could do a full FFT, so that would give us, like, a whole shape for the waveform. Um, so that's an option. Um, that's going to be computationally expensive, but that's probably fine. Um, or we could do... I actually don't know if this is FFT based or not, um, but we could do what's called centroid analysis, which is going to give us basically a, what we would want from this is the analysis to tell us 
what is the central frequency? Um, what frequency has the most energy in the incoming signal? And maybe we want more than one on a channel. That's going to be difficult to work with. Um, but basically, the goal here is we're going to use it kind of like a sidechain compressor or like a dynamic multiband thing. So when we take three inputs, we can basically say, oh, this one's loudest right now, so do something with that. Or yeah, like if one channel could like have like a sidechain style effect, it would turn down the volume of the other channels. Um, Conversely, another channel could be have like a spectral analysis where it would say if the if the spectrum like the if a, the, maybe it would be more like this signal we want to like allow its like main melody note maybe to come through um, then you could analyze the centroid and basically dock that amount on all the other channels and boost it on this one. Um, so that's, I think that's an idea I kind of want to pursue. So, that's the concept of like a per channel structure. I think it could be implemented in analog, um, probably. It might be a lot of circuitry, but. It's a big panel, so there's plenty of space for it. So that's, I think that's an idea for like how to structure this. So what does that mean? We could look at it as um Okay, so if you think about compression, um, we have this idea of downward compression, right? Where you say, you basically, all you do is you say if, oh, ooh, it's not right. what I'm thinking about is side chaining. So when a signal gets really hot and it's like the, it's meant to be the one leading the mix. So say a kick drum is like the classic example. Um, rather than increasing the volume of the kick drum, you just decrease the volume of everything else. Right? And that'll give you, it actually kind of levels out the mix. Um, but what it specifically allows us to say is we don't have to turn up the volume of the kick drum. All we have to do is turn down the volume of everything else. And the way we can do that is rather than having to like turn down the volume of everything else, except the kick drum, we can just turn down the volume of everything and only boost the kick drum to counterbalance the cut that it's going to go through afterwards. Um, so I think that will make it easy to do this in an efficient way. Similarly with the frequency cuts, right? Rather than necessarily cutting everything else, you just cut one one location and you change the amount of cut um or rather you have like a, a an inverse boost on the channel that's going to cut away that frequency so what i'm imagining here is essentially a like side chaining filter chaining um mixer so i think this is going to be, everybody's going to hate me for saying this, but I don't want to give each channel a volume control, right? Maybe there's a VCA jack if you want it. Um, but I don't think, 
I don't think we necessarily need to like put in a volume control. Instead, we're going to use this concept of strength and presence. Um, so strength, these words might change, but strength is going to mean um, really means volume, and presence is going to mean filter. Again, very vague, but that's kind of the point. Um, and I think what one really good thing about this concept is it's going to make it work in the middle of a patch super well. Um, but I don't think it will compromise the ability to use it as an output mixer. It's just that you're going to have to learn to play it, right? And the way you play it is through your signals. It's not through hands of control. Um, so it might make you rethink everything that comes before it because, uh, if, I don't know, probably a lot of you have like made mixes, right? And like a lot of people say, don't put any effects on the master bus when you're mixing in the first place. But other people will say, put a compressor on the output and mix into it, right? And it gives you a very different sense of like how relative volume works and relative EQ works across the channel. So with that kind of idea, we're just taking it like 25 steps further and forcing you to always use it in an extreme way. <laughs> um, okay, so what if the three channels had a control for these, each one has strain and each one has presence? Then we have the main volume, which is going to push and pull everything. And I think this having a VCA is going to be what makes it work as like part of a voice, right? So this could actually be your VCA. The three channels could be different waveforms. They could be animated, different oscillators. Um, oh, and by the way, I'm this. Spectral analysis we're doing, we're going to do it digitally. Um, but the idea is the signal path is going to stay analog. Um, I don't know that there's a way to do centroid analysis in analog that isn't like a wall of electronics. Um, well, so this idea, three channels, the alternative channels, we have this idea of like having three extras. So what if those three extras were like, um, they could just be plugged into the bus, right? Because we talked about this idea that when a strong signal... Sorry, so I should step back a little bit. This is going to be a multiplier, right? Um, so one X is going to be at the top. Meaning like... Maybe this control does two things, right? Maybe it does decrease the volume a little bit. Um, but the idea is, if you turn this control up, this cha this channel, this channel is going to like dominate volume wise. So when, um, if volume is high, then knock everything else. I think that's an idea. Um, as you turn it down, if you put it at zero, then basically it would have no impact on the mix. Um, or maybe it would actually kind of make itself push back in the mix. Um, Thing. The way these are going to work is when the signal comes in and it's hot, when the signal comes in and it's really loud, uh, and this is turned up, it's going to duck the volume of everything else. So we could have uh, three additional signals just kind of pipe in at the end. Um, additional channels. 
And so all these channels would have happened to them is basically anything coming in on these three channels would negatively affect these. So if this particular one had a frequency boost in this region, it would cut that frequency out of everything on the additional channels. That's one option. The other way is maybe we could do it as like the inverse of this. So Okay, my idea is, what if the, the strength and presence of a channel is um, generally one voice, right? But maybe there's a normalized jack that allows you to split it, right? So this one, um, you can cut three here by having one cable here, but also another, um, like, alt input. And so that would basically say, this channel no longer, um, this channel coming in no longer has presence control, instead it only has strength control. And the alternative one that we plug in only has presence control. I think this could be something to pursue. I don't know, we'll find out. Um, so that would be an easy way to add like way more channels in. We could still have these additional channels too. Um, so there's that. Okay, so strength, presence. One thing we haven't talked about is space and pan. Um, do we want to put reverb in? Yes, but are we going to? Absolutely not. Um, Space you can do in a number of ways, right? It can just be pan, or it can be quad, you know, you can like do multi-channel pan. We could do like a three-point pan, so you basically have like center, um, and like, like in a two, uh, three-point one system. Um, So you have a center channel and then two then two others which are basically space channels um so that's kind of like a mid side but the side itself is stereo which is not something you can typically do with mid sides um like it would be three completely independent channels we could do something like that um What else? We could, so you can do stuff with phase. You can use like uh, basically phase shifts to make to make certain elements come forward on one speaker in, if it, in, in like a stereo context. Um, if you delay the phase of one channel, even though it's the same volume, it sounds quieter. Um, that could be fun. Um, what else could we do for space? And I guess a big question is how do we do space without having to add another set of controls? Because I don't know, if, I don't think we have room to put I mean, we could maybe squeeze nine pots on here with, with the large volume control. Um,
I mean, we could do... Do we want to do LCR? I guess my point is, if we're putting in modern signals, I don't really want to just like, excuse me. Um, I don't just want to like impart a pan or impart some kind of spatialized thing on top of it, right? Because like you could just do that with another module if it's just going to be whacked on at the master output channel. Um, the only thing that makes sense is if we put something on a per channel basis, and that begs the question what's the interface and what is, like, how much control do people have over changing that per? Um, it's difficult because, wow. If we're talking, we're going back to this idea of, like, having all of this control be basically pushing down the, the general mix and leaving the main channel at its original volume, that makes it difficult to do a two or three channel thing because we're going to have to double or triple the circuitry to apply those things because we have to do it individually per channel. Um, what, like the one idea, obviously, is to say left, center, right. Um, that could be one thing. Yeah, okay. That's a good idea. This control, shout out to a post ghost. Oh, wait, no. Glass wave pool. Drink not only does volume, but it also bring something into center, which is like focus. I think one issue with that is, again, we don't have a sense of what is stereo. Um, I don't want to make a stereo mixer. It's just too much extra circuitry. That's my like very lazy uh, thought about it. Um, but if they could somehow do this kind of thing. Uh, I mean, I guess if it just gave us like two mixes, right? A main mix and a sub mix, then it would be up to the synthesis to decide how to, like basically we have like a, a dominant channel and a recessive channel. Um, yeah, then you could say like, okay, like the main channel, let's like, just like, smack it right in the center of our mix, whereas the other channel, let's put it through a reverb and send it 100% wet, um, maybe in stereo then. That way, we're not imparting some artificial stereo impact here, but we are um, yeah, it's not just like the artificial thing, but instead it's like saying like, you can do it whatever you want. The cool thing here is if we take that mindset where we're mixing into the main channel versus the, the background channel, foreground, background, that's, the, that's how we're going to talk about it. Yo, that's, that's what it's called. Oh, it's, this is really dumb, but... I think that could be a really central concept, right? Please tell me if that is a horrible abbreviation for something I don't want to be writing on the board. Um, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So then the concept of the mixer becomes having all these inputs and choosing whether they get pushed into the foreground or the background. And the idea would be if all of the knobs are zero, everything is equally split between foreground and background. And as you send these signals in and they 
and basically the analysis engine says, oh, this signal is really strong, well, this, this frequency is really strong, that particular piece gets pulled, like gets kind of pulled towards the foreground, and everything that's getting cut away is getting cut away, it's getting, basically getting decreased from that foreground, maybe increased in the background. Um, so basically we're talking about like, that's essentially every channel having a crossfader. Um, my mind is spinning at the horrific amount of circuitry this might require. But hey, if it sounds good, I'll make 20 of them. Um, basically mid-side, yes, but we're not, we're not actually, we're not doing any encoding. If you want to do mid-side, sure, you can take it as left, right, and encode it, whatever. Um, not that that would, maybe you could decode it. I don't think it would necessarily work. You would have to first process the background channel with some kind of uh, smearing engine like a reverb, and then you could decode it as if it were mid side. Bug bug, that's awful. Okay, we're changing the name. <laughs> um, oh, it could just be called ground. I like this idea. Maybe I just drank too much coffee. I need to take a five minute break. Mostly to use the loot. I shall return. Okay, I think we need to wipe this off, so I'm just going to take a picture, so we can continue. Something that wouldn't exist outside of your, yeah, we're about to get the CV control, I think that's going to be what makes it really interesting.
one thing I really like doing when I'm working on stuff like this is you have all these ideas and you write a bunch of stuff and then like you think about it a bunch and then you're like, oh, what do I need? I'm, I'm just going to write down like three words and make them as small as possible. Um, just to kind of give yourself space to think, to let yourself yourself being trapped by your own ideas. Okay, so should we go large? So two out. I want to do two outputs, right? I, scale is really hard on this big, on a panel so big. We're probably going to add more than two outputs just because it's like pretty deep. Um, more coffee. Who's who's talking shit to me? I'll fight you. There's no, there's no reverb. I can't do it. It's too much. I would love to put a big spring reverb in a case. I want to, we wanted to make a new isms that had a, a mini isms that had a reverb spring inside, but fine, like, it's really impossible to manufacture that stuff in a way that makes sense. Okay, um, foreground and background. I want to write them, we're going to color code this somewhat. It's a start. Okay, check it out. We're going to go three additional inputs, which don't influence the mix, but are influenced by the mix. And so they're going to be, how would we do this? We'll do it like this. All right, this would make more sense if we go vertically. So FG down the bottom, EG up top, that probably makes less sense. Then this is our like AUX expansion, right? This is F, this is B, and this is center, right? These are additional inputs. Additional inputs. These are our main outputs. And the idea is the background channel mixes directly like this. So one of them is like evenly panned between foreground and background, and then depending on the mix, it will get pushed foreground or background. Does this make anybody feel like they're on a boat? Or just me? Um, foreground only gets pushed back, and background maybe gets pulled forward. I'm not sure how that would work, because the concept seems mostly about pushing things from foreground to background. But we will persevere regardless. Anketronics tanks. The tanks are cheap. The issue is mechanical assembly with reverb springs. Um, not to mention they're incredibly noisy, and it's, if you put it inside of a piece of circuitry, you have to add all this shielding and everything. It just makes it very complicated. And it seems like the kind of thing where, one, it would be very heavy and physically large, so it's expensive to ship around the world, and some people would put it in their case and it would be incredibly noisy and they'd want to send it back. It sounds like a nightmare, so I'm going to avoid that right now. <laughs> um, but hey, there's lots of great spring modules, spring reverb modules out there, so I would recommend it. It would be cool. Um, I think it would be a great a spring reverb on the background channel. Beautiful. A stereo spring reverb on the background channel. Perfect. Okay. Um, this is a little like micro output mixer. Then we have our three channels, right? Let's put them down the bottom for now. So these are main inputs. 
Um, then we're talking about having this idea of potentially like a, an alt mix or a um, like one that steals some of the processing. So we could do it from the top down, right? I know some people will hate having like patches on top and bottom, but as a concept, let's try it. So these are um, basically spectral only mixed presents. It's funny crossing things out with a whiteboard. Presence only mix. Then we want to have, is it just the big, yeah, I think we just go even bigger. So this is volume. So far so good. That knob is still probably not big enough. Um, then we have this like mix. It's kind of it's not a matrix, but it's kind of like a send system. They're probably too close together, but we'll try and keep it spacious um, for now. Okay, so these are going to be, let's call them strength. Um, and these ones will be presence. So, uh, Each one of these like represents a analysis block in the background. Um, Tipex, I, I know Tipex from uh, my upbringing, although we did not call it Tipex. That was a New South Wales thing. Can't have it. So I think one really cool thing here is we can every knob is going to basically represent a, a, a analysis quality. It might be two or it might only be one um, element, but we could do them potentially as outputs, right? This is going to be too many jacks, and we're not going to want to do everything, but I'm going to write it in for now. So basically, each of these, um, these are basically, uh, this is like a envelope follower out. And these are like a centroid out. So these centroids would be kind of like, they could be one dimensional or they could be two. Um, if they were, we could, we could do two, but basically they would give you a volt per octave signal that represents the central frequency of every channel. Um, That's cool. Wait, how big is this? We should be able to do, on a 30 HP panel, we should be able to do at least 12 jacks on the row. Currently that's, I mean, it's kind of six. Depends how you think of it. Uh, so we've got plenty of space. So the other thing we can do is, because these are all like doing this thing, we can we could just have, I'm not making any sense. These are all control CV uh, offsets, essentially. Every knob, pretty much in any modular synthesizer, every knob you turn is really just an offset voltage normaled into the CV input jack for that parameter. It's just that there's no jack and the knob is directly connected. 
which means that pretty much every control ever on a modular, you could have a jack to turn it uh, electronically. So let's add that. Every one. <laughs> it becomes a lot of inputs, right? Um, so these two are added together and create the signal that's at this point. Um, volume as well, right? And we can draw these connecting lines to basically show that they are connected. Okay, so this very quickly is like, oh, there's a lot of possibility for patch programming, right? Because having these individual outputs, I think makes it really, like these, these two rows would be interchangeable, right? They're both, this, this bottom one is like, how, how like loud is it? And the top one is like, what's the frequency? So this top one is going to be a continuous sweep, um, whereas the bottom one is going to be a thing that's about up or down, whereas this is more like left or right. So you could use these to control like an XY module, or you could like maybe modulate somehow the amount of frequency by a compression amount or something like that. Um, sorry, the top and bottom row are signal inputs. The blue Jacks in these two rows are CV inputs that are basically turning these knobs manually. The red jacks are the outputs of each analysis block. That's, that's the idea, I think. Um, okay, so another question is, should this CV jack input it could override the signal input from affecting the analyzer. Instead, it could be like, well, you don't, you don't have the, Ooh. right, what about this? The analysis block is really in here, right? So this is, I'm just representing a internal element. And the point is that the analysis happens directly on the input. So it takes its input from the signal, um, it analyzes it, creates a control voltage, and then passes it onto this red output jack. That's the like very basic version, right? With no cables plugged into these CV jacks, all of the red jacks normal into the blue, right? And all of a sudden, like, we can see it as like a different kind of signal flow. These signal inputs in parallel are getting mixed. Oh, this isn't going to work with the foreground background thing. Basically, they're all going to go this way. Like, they're all going to skip past the analysis. The analysis block is like, basically, all of these, C, all this CV right here is just um, analysis, CV generation, and it's going to send control voltages behind the panel to affect this, like, mix engine, which is going to do all the cutting and boosting and all of that stuff. Okay, so 
that's starting to be clearer to me. Um, and I think we can, I'm going to write cross up patch programming because I think we kind of have that. The CV capability, what would it mean to plug CV into a mix as input job? You're gonna hate me for this, but is this rubber ducking, ducking to Twitch helping your thought process? You might be surprised to know that this is actually how I operate when there's no one watching. <laughs> I stand in front of a whiteboard or in front of a notebook and I talk to myself. I talk to an invisible person that doesn't exist. All right. I'm going to wipe this off again. I have an idea that's going to change everything. It's six o'clock. Oh no. Let's, we're going to do one more idea and then I'm going to call it quits. We're going to say, okay, it's a concept. Um, it obviously is not going to be finished. It's not going to be something you could turn into a product instantaneously. Um, but it will be interesting nonetheless. It will be something to think about. And that's what I really want right now. I'm just going to draw the block, right? That's this. They are this. They are red. And we have green. So I don't know if anybody noticed, the top row was just an inverted version of the bottom row, right? Anyone else must be thinking, what the fuck, if they're not used to it? Yes, absolutely. I typically only do it when I'm home alone. <laughs> but it's fun. Feedback. Ooh, well, let's leave feedback here. It'll be one last thing to talk about. Okay, what I want to talk about is this, though. This is our little block diagram, right? It's signal, analysis, output, input for the analysis override, and then the influence control. But we have six of them, right? Why don't we just have six channels? Six channels where neighbors are normal together. And then that gives me an idea. So that means we then have like drink and presence. Right, um, which says, okay, that's just a modal concept. If any channel could do either strength or presence, what else could it do? So let's flip it upside down. This is our input. Let's call it, just to be clear, audio. Um, in helpers have lines around them. So let's say this is audio. Then we have, I think the way I'd want to do it is like a stack diagonal. So this is, oh. The layout doesn't matter. What am I talking about? Okay, so this is um, the analysis. This is CV. Then we have our control. And this is a block, right? We were talking about this being either uh, strength or presence. Um, What if it was switchable? 
So, and what if, what if we did it in like a, ah, so I don't know how many of you know this. Likely everybody. I really love a lot of the old Buchla designs. Um, specifically, I think the three position switch on the low pass gate, the 292, um, it's really great. It's like, to me, it's the best kind of modality to have in an instrument in that it's subtle, generally, right? And in all three modes, it kind of does the same thing. It like says, turn it all the way counterclockwise and you have less of a signal, turn it all the way clockwise and you have like the full signal. And then in between, it's just like three different flavors of what it should mean to decrease something's presence in the output. Um, obviously, one being volume, one being filtering, and one being a combination thereof. A really nicely tuned combination thereof. Um, so the, the classic low pass gate is both mode, it's called. And is it? Now I'm second guessing myself. Maybe it's called gate. Anyway, the point is, it's thought of most of the time as both, meaning both filtering and volume. So what if we had a switch? We'll have to redesign this layout um, with three positions being at the top, it's volume. At the bottom, it's filter, so again, strength, presence, or both in the center. Um, that makes this output very vague. I don't know what that would mean. So maybe this is not possible. Um, I'm going to redraw this one more time to make it extra quick. So I, I realize I'm being unclear on the screen. Okay, so this is audio input. We have a switch here, which is, wait, before I even do that, this output, th this is basically bust maybe twice. Well, it doesn't need to be this. It's only one. Let's be honest. Okay. So this gets bussed to the mix. And on that mix, we're going to... This is not correct, sorry. So we have the audio input. Um, it has... Some kind of so the blue means it's not a hardware thing. It's like it's circuitry. Um, this is going to apply. There's going to be a boost, right? And that could be volume or it could be frequency. Uh, we don't know, um, but that that will be decided by this block up here. So uh, it's going to go into here, and that's going to go to the mixer. Like to the to the main mix, um, and this is going again to a another blue block, which is analysis for either the volume or the frequency, or maybe both. Um, the output of which. The output of which goes to an output jack. Which is typically 
normaled into this input jack, which is added to the state of this, uh, like this signal is added to or maybe multiplied by um, this control up here. And then it's the output of this that controls the actual boost cut. And this signal is also sent to inverse. Uh, so basically, then like on the mixer channel, we have for every channel, we have a, basically a cut at the output, which is going to do the inverse of this block. So these two are linked, right? And this one goes to second channel, right? Um, and then the, the main output mix goes through here, through here, and then goes to your output. That's the concept. So maybe the point is, if we let, so analysis, it, it, it infers a couple things. Um, for every style of analysis we have, we need to have an ability to apply that analysis kind in both the positive and the negative. So we're going to apply it in the positive on a per channel basis and in the negative on the main mix. So everything all together. Um, the thing that got me excited about this like three option idea was that what if we had volume and filter but also foreground background. Like what if the foreground background thing wasn't just like what this was all about, but maybe it's like a dedicated option. Um, no idea, I don't know. Um, It just seems like maybe it works for everything to be that way. This is, I don't know, I don't know if this made it any clearer. I just want to draw an example of pushing something from the foreground to the background in the filter context and in the, um, the frequency context. So say we have an input. Um, this is our in, let's say it's a, this is going to be a spectrum drawing. I guess I should do it. It's pretty small, but it should make sense. Um, okay, we, we have two inputs. Input one is a sine wave. So it's basically a really strong signal right in the center. Let's call it one kilohertz, doesn't matter. And input two is uh, noise, right? So it should be roughly level um, at every frequency, right? So this, in this case, obviously this sine wave, what we wanted to do is basically, it's gonna stay the same. We're not gonna affect it. Um, and we're gonna use the centroid to 
let's say, let's mix them together, we'll bust them like this, um, and then we're going to do a filter which is controlled by this as an, this analysis, the centroid. And what that's going to give us is a basically a notch filter, right? Um, we're going to have a we're going to do a boost filter, which is the inverse of it up here before we send it into the mix. Um, and so this is just a filter. And the result because this is isn't gonna be like a brick wall filter, it's gonna be a notch filter. The result's gonna look something, I'm gonna draw it bigger so we can really see what's going on. And this is like the nominal level. And what we're going to see is an output spectrum that's something like this. So this is the sine wave, and then this is all noise. It would probably be much lower down in terms of volume, but it has this, this notch effect in here, which I think would actually be really interesting. Um, sorry, I'm just reading these comments. Um, I'm not sure if it's unclear what I'm saying or if it's just that you guys have a different idea. Um, the concept is that every channel is independent. Um, and this like cutting thing isn't about cascaded channels. It's like this is on the the main mix. This is the this is affecting everything. So we just are like pre-boosting it before it gets there, so that this one is net not affected. Um. Yeah. So we we boost it in advance of cutting it. That's the idea. So that these two, for this channel, the centroid boost and the centroid cut cancel out. Um, whereas everything else is just being cut. It's just... Exactly, yes. Um, this idea, I think with noise, it's like very simplistic. Um, doesn't make a lot of stuff, it doesn't seem that special. But I think the idea of stacking up three of these, like three different filters, would really allow like, different elements to kind of cut through, um, especially when this signal can be a CV, right? If you break that normalization by attaching a CV, no longer is the frequency of the sine wave controlling this output filter, but rather the CV control is basically just becoming a control voltage over this notch filter. Um, That's an option. It could actually change. Um, it could be an audio input rather than having to be a CV input. So you could actually key the centroid with a different signal. And so that keying concept, it's like sidechain compression. Um, this is filtering. Okay, I want to step back one step because. Yeah, how does this work, right? I'm going to change this back here. We need it to have more than one central frequency. The two inputs. So we have a fundamental and uh, some harmonic, and then Let's do, this is like a band limited noise, right? Or like maybe it's a really, it's an oscillator with lots of harmonics. Um, if we think about it in the foreground background context, 
what I think we want to be able to do. Foreground, background, if it's volume, is just going to push it. It's just going to pan, right? So if the volume increases, we're going to pan towards foreground. If the volume decreases, it goes back to its resting state. Um, maybe that knob is inverting. I think the thing where it gets uh, confusing, or like, what does it actually mean, is the spectrum thing. So what does it mean to foreground a spectrum, or foreground a a part of the spectrum. Um, so let's draw unaffected output. This is input. This is unaffected. And then we're going to draw another one after. I wish I could draw squares properly. If we're unaffected, we want to mix evenly, right? So let, let's just take that as an example. We're going to say we're split the two. So we'll start with the noise or the band limited oscillator. It's just going to be copied on both channels. And then overlaid on top, we're going to have some large frequency and some small frequency. I apologize, they're not the same. So if there's not, I mean, we could do centroid on this. Um, and it would basically choose the center of that noise band. But I think that's maybe less interesting. Let's, let's do the centroid on the input. So it will select, at least conceptually, hopefully, it will select this location as centroid, right? Whereas this one will be here. Um, so again, like this location. So the question is, what are we what are we going to do with that, right? Are we going to say, oh, we want that? that element to be boosted on this channel, or does it mean that we want to actually move it to the background? So if we just, rather than drawing lines, I'm going to draw it as a box, right? So this is the noise, and the noise down here. This is foreground, background, F, Cool. So, and my centroid is going to be here. So, what do we what do we do with that, right? I think um, I think what we do is push that frequency to the foreground in this channel and cut it in this channel, right? That seems like the obvious thing. So what that's going to look like is basically a boost in here. Oh, this is foreground, sorry. In this side, it's going to be a cut. And in this side, it's going to be a boost. Meanwhile, the signal here is dropped down from what it was, maybe to equal this one, which is going to be added. Whereas in this case, it's going to get boosted all the way up. 
And this piece over here is going to be unaffected because it's outside of the centroid range. I don't know. This sounds like something that we need to hear before we make a decision about whether that is interesting. I think this is about as far as we can go today. One thing to note is if the way it's implemented is a big stack of filters at the end, um, we could provide output taps that haven't had all the filtering or all of the volume control um, overlaid. If volume happens first, we could have a mix that's like pre-presence uh, and then another set that's after. Um, but yeah, so there's lots of possibilities there in terms of like signal paths and things. But I think it's, it's an idea. And we've gone way over time. So I'm going to tie it up. My phone ran out of battery. So uh, no more music. For me or for you, not that you can necessarily hear it. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think that's that's kind of it. Um, how how do you prototype? How do you prototype how that sounds like? Right. Um, I would probably. If I have modules to do it, I'll like just wire up a patch. Because I can't do the centroid stuff, I think I'd just use either Max or, yeah, realistically, I'd use Max MSP. Um, that would be my step towards hearing this. Um, or even just manually doing it. Right? Like. just having like even using a DAW and like just having a channel that's uh, you, you could just look at the spectrum and be like here's the loudest bit and cut that or boost that um, maybe boost it on that channel and cut it out of the master um, that feels like a way to at least just hear it on a static signal doing the frequency tracking is going to be probably the hardest part um, to get it sounding really you know, make it smooth and like have it be accurate. Um, I agree that looking at it with static signs isn't that interesting, but it might give you a sense of like what it could sound like or how it could like sculpt something. Because in a way, it like it looks at a lot of um, kind of mixing concepts. In a lot of ways, I think being able to do the inverse would actually be more interesting. If you if you made the centroid of a given input decrease, it would probably make that sound in a very real way, push it in the background, right? You're, you're cutting away the defining um, spectra of that instrument. Um, recommendations, personal study. Uh, that entirely depends on like, what are you what are you trying to get at? Are you trying to get at like the instrument design aspect, or are you trying to get at the signal processing? You know, like like the idea of like thinking about the filters and thinking about dynamics processing. Let me know if you have a more specific thing. Vocoder style stuff. Yeah, I mean, it could be possible. It's just like, yeah, I, I'm not really worried so much about the 
implementation detail. I'm more, I'm more kind of focused right now on how it's going to feel to push signals in and out of it. I think that's kind of what will define whether or not it's successful, whether it's like a super high quality digital thing that does it or, or it's like an analog thing. It's kind of secondary, at least at this point. Um, instrument design, instruments are interested in the process. That's a much harder question to ask, um, or rather a harder question for me to answer. Um, instrument design, I think that I didn't have any formal training in it. I think I would just say, I mean, the way I learned was just looking at other people's designs and like open source stuff is really great for that. I mean, just look at, look at uh, like even plugins that you can kind of understand. It's not so much about reading the code or understanding um, how something works. I think the beauty of instrument design is or the, the like the beauty and the curse of it is a hundred percent of it is visible to anybody who sees it. So like as soon as you release a device and somebody can experience it or see it, like it can be copied in, in the sense of the interface, which is the most interesting part, can be copied. How it's implemented doesn't matter. Um, and like typically I, I think if you if you aren't really good at something yourself, it's easier to it's maybe more effective to find somebody who's focused on that thing rather than doing it, rather than teaching yourself the whole process. But if what you're interested in is the instrument design, I, I think the best thing to do is just uh, soak up as much as you can, you know, and not just what things look like, but really get in there and like learn how things feel and teach yourself more tools, not so that you can necessarily use them, but so you can kind of get more of an understanding of how different people think about creative processes. Yeah, I don't know. It's really just, I, I just think, you have to think about your audience. First and foremost, like, who is going to be interested in this thing? And if the answer is only yourself, that's entirely fine. But you should just be, uh, you should make sure that you are aware that you are doing that. Um, but yeah, I don't know, just like, you, it, it's about practice, right? So you need to have a, a regular practice of like, you know, at least once a week, say, doing like the 15 minute warm up exercise. And even if you don't do anything else, you just do that and like scribble some ideas down and, and say, okay, I'm going to work on this idea and just like flesh it out as much as you can. Just like say, okay, what can I do with this thing? How can I make it more interesting? Um, I think that is a great way to do it. So that's all I'm going to say. I don't really know that I have much more to wax lyrical about. But thank you, everybody, for hanging out. It's a pleasure, as always. And uh, I don't know, send me a message, an email, if you have questions, if you have recommendations for the next the next one, et cetera, et cetera. OK, farewell. <laughs>